Chapter 6. Broken Heart of Fine Art Six days before my kidnapping and rape, my whole world had been already been blown to smithereens when I had found out that my mom and the guy I had been dating were having an affair behind my back. He had moved into my room temporarily since his lease was up and we were waiting on our apartment to be ready in Edmond, close to UCO, so that we could live together and I could walk the campus for classes. After I found out, I was frantic to get out of the apartment before she got home. I didn't ever want to see her again. I packed an overnight bag with random clothes, mostly work uniforms. My mind and my heart were racing. God, did I have to keep going to work? How was I supposed to function to do anything? I wasn't sure where to go. All I knew is that I just had to disappear. My best friend Lisa was studying out of state at the time, and I hadn't heard from her in months. I ran through a list of options where I could go until my apartment was ready, and suddenly my friend Nancy's name popped into my head. She lived close with her kids. I knew she had a couch and would be happy to let me crash on it for a few days. I texted her and immediately had a place to go. God, I hoped my apartment would be ready soon. I had no idea what to tell Nancy. Before I left, I bent down to scoop up my cat, my fur baby, Gracie Ann. I promised her I would be back for her soon. When I arrived at Nancy's, she greeted me with open arms. She knew I was upset, but I did not know how to talk to her or anyone about the betrayal that had just occurred. God, was I so unlovable and unfuckable that my boyfriend resorted to sleeping with my mother? It was a humiliating secret I would keep all to myself for a long time. Nancy let me stay silent about my problems and let me know that I had called just in the nick of time. The next day, she and her kids were headed to Dallas for a week of summer vacation. I would have the house to myself, and that's exactly what I needed, a place to shed my tears alone. After Nancy left, I realized I had left behind a few essential items at my mom's. So after a sequence of sleepless, tear-filled nights, just six days after being betrayed by the person who had taught me about integrity and purity, I found myself at Walmart, <coughs> then kidnapped and raped. Although Oscar had denied seeing me, after my rape exam, the police returned to his house and questioned him again. They found barbed wire in the wheel well of his truck and a bite mark on his left shoulder. Additionally, they collected the surveillance videos from the Walmart parking lot, which showed my abduction. They had collected enough evidence to take him into custody and hold him in jail until he went to trial. My story had made the front page news in the Yukon paper, and I was not yet out of Yukon. I was putting gas in my Ford Focus on the following Monday, two days after the rape, when I went into the store to pay for my gas and saw it. Right there on the counter, next to a display of impulse buys, was a stack of papers and Oscar's face staring right at me. His mugshot, his furrowed brow, his dark eyes and angry looking into the camera while he was dressed in an orange jumpsuit. I felt my heartbeat start in my wounded crotch although I wasn't sure if it was from the actual rape or the exam that was done afterward. I felt cold and lifeless on the inside, reinforcing what I had recognized when I got home that Saturday afternoon is that something had changed inside of me. Something had died. Look, Mom and Dad, I made the paper, I thought. They would be so proud. Grabbing several copies of the paper and a stack of gum, I slid my purchases across the counter to the cashier. Quite a story, huh? said the young chick behind the counter smacking her gum. And hey, Yukon? The world has gone crazy. That kind of stuff only happens in big cities. At least we know this monster is behind bars. Poor girl. I didn't respond. I didn't even look up or acknowledge that she was even there. I wanted to tell her to shut the fuck up and stop smacking her gum. What the fuck did she know about what happened at Yukon? She couldn't even talk without smacking her stupid gum. I imagined how many thousands of papers had been printed and were on display in every store and gas station in Yukon. Luckily, my name wasn't in the paper, just his. There was no doubt in my mind that word would leak out about who the victim was, and when it did, my life there would be over. I had to get out of Yukon. Four days later, I finally heard from the apartment manager in Edmond. I went back to my mom's apartment when nobody was home and gathered my personal things. I didn't have much, and the most valuable item was my baby kitty, Gracie. I only brought a few changes of clothes, a couple of pairs of shoes, and a little basket of earrings and makeup when I left my mom's. I'd always been a simple girl, and I remember realizing it during my trip to Cozumel, where I had been content and fulfilled while living out of one simple suitcase. 
The apartment manager, Randy, <clears throat> received me kindly before taking us upstairs to my new place. He studied the small heap of belongings I pulled out of my car. Do you need help carrying anything up? He was petting Gracie until she looked back at him with dark eyes. <laughs> he was enough of a cat lover to know that meant, touch me again and you get shanked. This is all I have, I said. What about a bed, a mattress, pillows, furniture? I had taken a big fuzzy blanket off my mom's couch when I went back for Gracie. I just shrugged my shoulders. He was silent for a moment, studying me. I was silent in return. I have an apartment I use for storage, where I keep things left behind by tenants. I can see if there are things there that you need. The mattress there isn't new, but I only keep things that are in good condition. So it's clean. I have an extra pillow if you need one as well. I agreed that I would let him look, mostly because I didn't have any other option. That night he came up with a mattress and a pillow where Gracie and I would sleep on the floor. This will get you fixed up tonight, kiddo. At least to sleep. In the next few days, we will see what else we can find. Finally, I had met someone kind. We would grow to be friends in time. In fact, he was the only person I had in my life at all during that period, and I would later understand that he was divinely placed onto my path to oversee me during this awful time in my life. The next day, the DA called. The trial was set. I was going to see him, my rapist. I would once again tell my story, only this time it would be in front of a full courtroom and a jury of strangers. My dad called twice a week before the trial, sharing with me that my mother wanted to support me and that at times like these, girls need their mothers. I told him to tell her no. She wasn't welcome at my trial. She wasn't welcome to know where I lived or even be anywhere near my life. The day of my trial, I wore a pink sweater and black flats. I took the stand and Oscar was ushered into the courtroom in handcuffs, wearing the orange jumpsuit. I had seen on the front page of the Yukon paper. He sat down with his attorney and looked straight at me with a smug, shit-eating grin on his face. He had said I wouldn't have the courage to file a report, but I did. And here we were, facing each other before a jury. He said nobody would believe me if I spoke. And now we would find out if that was true. I had to speak. I had to tell my story in front of all those people. My dad was there with the youth pastor for my high school years. The jury was listening and ready, and the rest of the people in the seats were all strangers staring back at me. It was time to do what I came here to do. I always wondered who the strangers were and why they came to my trial. I never found out. The district attorney questioned me first and I gave him my testimony. It was then that Oscar's attorney cross-examined me. Did you and the defendant once date? Yes. Did you ever have sexual relations during the course of that relationship? Yes. Then how is this occurrence a rape? How could I prove it was against my will? But his last question was the worst. Ms. Reeves, is it true that you were raped by a man from your church in the past year? My heart dropped and the room turned upside down. I felt my chest start to close and the walls of the courtroom began closing in on me. Yeah, it was true. The previous rape had happened. Oscar was the only one I had never told. One night after too much wine while we were dating, then I put the conversation and the trauma both back in a box and hid it really deeply within myself. I never went back into that church. Little did I know that when I went to trial to face my kidnapping rapist ex-boyfriend, I didn't have to talk about just one rape in front of a courtroom of strangers that day. I had to talk about two. Oscar was laughing in front of me. The only thing I could muster to answer the attorney's question about why I hadn't reported the previous attack was a quiet, I don't know, while I stared at my hands, folded in my lap. I found myself wishing the judge would just hang me so that I wouldn't be humiliated anymore. No more questions, Your Honor. Courtroom adjourned. All I wanted was to lay on the used mattress on the floor of my musty apartment and listen to Gracie purr in my ear. The softness of her fur always fixed everything. The two jobs I had when I moved to Edmond were only summer jobs, and they ended when I moved into my apartment. This was the first time I was completely on my own, and on top of all the trauma I had just endured, I was also facing tremendous financial pressure to figure out how to pay for my apartment and the bills that came with it. Since Randy was the only one working for the apartment complex, he asked his boss about hiring me to help him clean and fix up the complex, which had been in foreclosure, 
and there was a lot of work to do to get the units rented out. Luckily, his boss said yes, and we began our new adventure. To this day, working with Randy at that apartment complex was one of my favorite jobs. I found a fullness and joy that came with working for myself. Even though I still technically worked for a guy in California who owned the property, I was in control of my own work schedule. Randy and I had so much fun together, and I soon learned that I loved to get dirty, do heavy work, use my hands every day. Randy was a genius when it came to, well, everything related to fixing. He taught me how to lay tile, how to change out the plates for light switches and outlets, how to install plumbing and flooring. He would take on that main role of the job and teach me what he knew while I assisted him. He taught me how to paint and how to clean professionally to a military standard. He had learned that when he spent six years in the U.S. Army. One time, I organized a potluck for all the tenants where everyone brought a traditional dish from their native country so that we could all experience something from each culture. Most of the tenants at that apartment complex were international students from Kenya, Ghana, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Japan, Turkey, China, Morocco, and Kuwait. Together, Randy and I built a tightly knit community there. It was safe for both Gracie and me. I always left the doors open to my apartment and to whatever apartment I was working in so that Gracie could wander back and forth. She was a part of everything I did, even while I cleaned and painted. She would often just hang out in the apartment I was working in, sprawled out on the floor to nap or swooping in the new nooks and crannies. Sometimes others in our apartment complex kept treats just for her and would have her come hang out inside if she wanted to go into their spaces. She was the apartment complex mascot. After a long day of work, I would get back up to my apartment to make Gracie and me dinner. While the job didn't pay very much, Gracie and I were hungry often, but Gracie always got fed before I did. and We worked together no matter what. We ate together. She loved everything I cooked. Every day I promised her I would work hard to offer her the life she deserved. One day I will build you a kitty castle, I promised her. For the time being, I felt like it would be okay stuffing all my broken pieces deep down inside me as long as I could just work all day, every day. I truly loved working with Randy, and it was rare that we weren't having fun. When tenants moved out, they often left useful things behind. Within just a couple of months, my apartment was beautifully furnished with a full kitchen, a dining table with a bench, a soft imitation leather couch, a TV, a stand with shelves for my books, and lamps. I had an assortment of different plates, coffee cups, and silverware, but I liked it that way. One night, Randy came over for dinner and saw the newspaper laying on the kitchen table. Jesus Christ, what the fuck is wrong with these people? He said in disbelief after skimming the article. This crazy motherfucker just ruined the life of an innocent person. He had a girl with me, I confessed. He choked on a sandwich. You're the victim from this article? I told him the horror story of testifying in front of all those strangers. Randy promised that I would be safe, no matter what the verdict from the jury was. I hoped that that was true.